Hi, everyone. We'll be starting the next talk now. Um, so um, Mary will be telling us about Vault on DCOS, Secure Secret Management on Budget. Hello, friends. Um, I see I got all the devs here. Um, thanks for coming. Um, yeah, so my talk is going to take you through some basics of uh, secret management. Um, if you are used to working with an in-house solution of your own, you're probably going to roll your eyes a little bit because this is a different approach. But I hope there's still some valuable things that I can show you and inspire you. Great, so who am I? Um, I'm Mary. I work at Precal.org, which is a non-profit, and it works in the health and youth sector. So what it does is it builds some mobile technologies, and um, it helps people with supporting their lifestyle. Like maybe if you're pregnant, um, there's a service that can help you with that. It says, hey, your baby is like six months old. Please go to the doctor. Don't drink alcohol, that kind of thing. The other one is um, the youth portfolio, which is very cool. Um, this is an aspirational picture of what people using our service might um, might do, you know, log on to the service with their phones, and that gives um, interesting discussions about youth topics like, my blesser does not want to use a condom, what do I do? Which is, you know, relevant to the youth today. So, what is the purpose of the talk? To anchor this talk, um, I'm going to give you a bit of an introduction to secret management from very basic first principles, um, and hopefully introduce some cybersecurity tools and primitives for secret management and scale. Um, and then the very last thing is like some learnings about how and how not to handle secrets. Because uh, you can do it the right way and then you can do it the wrong way that um, makes people happy and do talks about. So, um, very basic stuff. What is a secret? You all probably have an intuitive idea of what a secret is. So basically it's some kind of knowledge or um, piece of information that's hidden from entities that are not supposed to know them. And um, the knowledge of the secret is usually used to authorize people and really um, confirm that their identity is what they say they are. So examples of secrets in computing, passwords, RSA, private keys, um, encryption keys, API tokens, those are secret. You shouldn't be telling them to all your friends. So there are lots of ways to actually break into some software infrastructure, but one of the most I mean, one of the low-hanging fruit ways is to compromise passwords and to look for places where people have been handling them carelessly. So if you, you know, ever been in an offensive role, guessing passwords has always been, you know, one of the things that you do first, just to see if you can get in that way. Cool. And so let's talk about the anatomy of a secret. Not the regular anatomy, but the anatomy that hackers actually care about. So let's look at the attack surface. So um, the attack surface can be comprised of many parameters, but the three very important ones that we're going to look at today is the temporal attack surface, which is the period of time for which a secret is valid. Um, and that, that means that there's more time for you to guess the secret and win a lot. Um, there's the, also um, the spatial attack surface. So that's the number of interfaces for which your secret is valid. So if you're using the same secret on a lot of different inter interfaces, you're increasing your spatial attack surface, which means that there's more opportunities and more places where people can poke and get at that secret. The last one is the algorithmic attack surface, which is the algorithmic determinism of the secret. And I count like people are likely to use admin admin as an algorithmic determinism. Um, and so the al algorithmic determinism is basically properties of that secret generation algorithm that allows you to maybe sequence it and um, figure out how it's generated and then make, maybe make your own values. And yeah. So a full 80% of data breaches, you know, like around that area, are caused by silly mistakes and people being careless when they're handling secrets. It's not that, you know, people are breaking crypto or necessarily being extremely um, sophisticated in their attacks. Um, it really is secret management, SQL injection, you know, really basic stuff. So to anchor this talk, I'd really like to uh, tell a little story about our infrastructure. Um, and if you've been to the Docker talk earlier, um, that would be really great because there's some continuity. Um, cool. So here's the example. So at Precult.org, uh, we use a lot of open source software, non-profit, not too much money, open source yeah. things. Um, so what happens is we usually run our Python web applications as Docker containers on the open source version of Mesosphere's DCOS. Um, and what that is, is it's a container orchestration platform. So um, in the previous talk about Docker, if you were there, um, 
you know, you were introduced to maybe how to run Docker containers from the command line. But what if you want to do that at scale? So what if you want your web applications to be able to serve lots and lots of people? So we are ambitious in that way. Um, we're not huge scale, but we are medium scale. So we expect to serve millions of connections. We expect to be sending millions of messages every day. And so our infrastructure needs to scale to accommodate that. So the nice thing about chat, um, container orchestration is that it helps you to put your Docker containers where you actually have resources. So maybe you have sort of high availability kind of things. You have several servers, and according to the resources and um, according to the availability of resources on those services, you might provision Docker containers on one or maybe on the other. So that's what an orchestration framework can do for you. Um, yeah, and the other important thing is we, ho we host our code bases on GitHub. So um, both our web application code bases and um, our configuration databases like, um, like Puppet, um, we host those all on GitHub. And the configs are, are private, but it's still on GitHub. So what does this architecture look like in practice? So this is vastly simplified, but what happens is, um, say somebody wants to launch a web app, and it says, okay, so here, if you're not very familiar with um, a cluster setup or, yeah, if you're not familiar with a cluster, I hope this is not, um, it is reasonably intuitive. So what happens is you have some controllers over here and they have knowledge of basically what resources are available. And by resources, I mean um, worker nodes and um, some stateful services. And what happens is somebody says, hey, please run this Docker image um, with these parameters to the controllers, and the controller's like, hey, everybody who has capacity. Um, maybe worker two is like, yeah, I'll take it. Um, so then you end up running your uh, Docker container on worker two. Um, container orchestration is pretty awesome. Um, and what happens is, um, as you can see from that particular container, um, it's an example one, it might connect to some stateful services. So um, in general, like, I don't want to be too prescriptivist about this, but um, in general, you don't really want to run stateful services inside Docker because Docker is, it's meant to, you know, be kind of fail fast if it, if it, you know, if it eats poop, like, you need to be able to restart it very quickly. And if you have state in there, you lose that state. So usually we have stateful services outside of that paradigm that those containers connect to. So if you need, like, a Postgres database or your RabbitMQ vhost, they do connections to those persistent services. Great, so our containers run Red Apps that need stateful services, as I mentioned. Um, and yeah, I mean, we usually use databases, message queues, vanilla, really vanilla stuff. So how do these web apps get access to the stateful services? Why? They authenticate them uh, against them with a secret, of course. Oh, so what do we do at the moment? At the moment, this is, um, this is more of a what not to do thing. At the moment, we create and configure stateful services manually um, using Puppet. So we write the puppet configs, gets pushed to GitHub, and then you know the puppet agents on the host we want to configure run those configs. Voila! Any usernames and passwords required on these services are described in the puppet config, uh, which is in that GitHub repo. And you can quickly see why oh, that might be an issue. But first, what we do when we deploy is we then copy paste those credentials from the puppet repo into the environment variables when we try to launch our containers. So what happens is, hey, please run this Docker container. By the way, you need to connect to the Postgres database on this particular address. It's called Postgres. Um, and as an environment variable, your username is admin and your password is admin. So that's how we do things these days. As you can tell, this is pretty risky. But um, just clarify on why that is risky. So there's two big issues here. The first thing is that we're storing static credentials in GitHub. And the second issue is that we're passing in um, the credentials as environment variables. And if you've ever been um, on the offensive side of things, one of the first things you get when you get a shell is like, you know, check the environment variables. Um, so the risks of passing secrets as, uh, secrets as environment variables. If somebody manages to break into your Docker container, they can get your secrets. Environment variables are commonly exposed in application logs. So um, sometimes, like, you don't expect them to do it, but sometimes they do that. Um, many web app frameworks, debug mode will display environment variables by default. And by web app frameworks, I mean, like, Python, Django. Like, if you put debug mode, there's some, um, there's some filters you can put in on what variables it displays or not. But if you're working with arbitrary environment variables, that's very difficult to control. So, and then the last thing is 
the credential leaks could happen if your process forks to interact with the third party uh, application, and that third party application has implicit access to your environment. So this doesn't really happen that much in practice, but it can happen. The next thing is um, storing secrets in GitHub, static secrets in GitHub. So um, can I get a show of hands? Like, does anybody do this? Like in a, in a private repo, has anybody done this? I appreciate your candor. So here's some risk. You probably already know this, but just to like really spell it out, um, GitHub is designed to preserve history. So unrevoked credentials in Git history are a point of exposure. And as I'm going to mention later, even if those um, credentials are revoked, they can still expose you to a little bit of risk. If somebody at GitHub really wanted your secrets, they could get them. Um, it's quite possible to make a private repo public by accident, and that has happened, and it is not good. Um, and it's very easy to expose more secrets than needed to third-party contractors and interns. It's like the intern needs access to maybe the one Postgres database, but you're like, okay, I'll give you access to this um, Puppet uh, repository, right? Um, that's got credits to like all our databases, but like just pretend you didn't see them. So it's very hard to isolate um, access that way. More. Um, so it's really easy for those with access to fork and clone secrets wholesale. Um, that has happened with us before, and um, it was not pleasant. Like, who forked this? That's so weird. But in the end, if they wanted a database full of your credentials, they could. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, there's very coarse-grained access control. So you can't really say, like, oh, you get access to this portion of secrets, and you don't if they're both in the same GitHub repository, because that's how the controls are enforced. The last thing is you need to rotate and revoke credentials manually, which becomes really tedious the more stateful services you need to manage. Which brings me to the very important part, which is it does not allow for security best practice at scale. So things like key rolling, um, things like revocation, that's heavily manual with the setup. And in general, just not a great idea. Um, so let's try and do this right. Okay, so um, let me outline some of the secret management tasks that you should be looking at. So the first thing is creating secrets. You need to create a good secret, admin, admin, no, not so good. Um, storage of secrets, so secure storage. Um, storing them in plain text, no, please don't. Um, the distribution of secrets, uh, which is the, the really fun stuff, is to try to get the secret from your storage to your consumer securely. And the last thing is to manage the life cycle of the secret. So when I mentioned um, the temporal attack surface for the secret, um, life cycle management helps narrow that. So that's good. So in terms of creation and storage, we're migrating our secret creation and storage to HashiCorp's vaults. Um, can I get a show of hands? Um, who's, who's been looking at vaults, poking at vaults? Ooh. Um, so vaults is very, very exciting. Um, it's a secret management solution that is well maintained. It's open source, so um, it jives with us, and it's designed with high availability and container orchestrators in mind. So it doesn't have components that does that, but it has APIs that plays well with those kinds of setups. What can it do for you? It can generate, secure, store, and control access to tokens, passwords, certificates, API keys, and other secrets. Um, it's gone through a couple of independent audits, and um, the audits came out pretty good. Uh, what it also does is can help you with leasing, key revocation, key rolling, and auditing, because um, it keeps some logs, and its leasing system is tied to like the time where stuff was issued. So auditing becomes maybe a bit easier because you can narrow down the times where uh, credentials were issued or revoked. Um, and the nice thing is that it exposes all of the stuff through a REST API, which is um, the fashionable thing with which microservices might like to communicate these days. Great. So, Vault is only one piece of the puzzle. Um, as I mentioned, it plays well with all of these other workflows, but it doesn't actually do anything in terms of um, secure distribution. So, um, which brings me on to the next part of secret management, which is distributing secrets. So what does that entail? Well, it entails getting the secret from Vault to the correct consumer. Um, you need to keep the secrets safe from exfiltration during transit, um, and then scaling that secret distribution with large numbers of consumers, because um, with this is kind of container orchestration and um, things like that we're talking about. So, um, before I go any further, I'd like to talk about some uh, secret management primitives. So, one of these things is trust. So, um, I think, I hope everybody has a reasonably intuitive idea of what trust might be, but just to spell that out, um, trust between software actors refers to maybe waiving the frequency or rigor 
with which an authorization routine is conducted for privilege requests. So an example of this in real life is you might consider installing some burglar bars or an alarm in your house, but once you're inside the house, like putting burglar bars on your bathroom is maybe just cruel. Um, so usually what happens is once you've gone through the front door and the alarm doesn't get set off, that is a trust zone that you're in and um, you, know, you don't need to like, authenticate yourself or use any keys or codes to get into any other rooms of the house. Um, in terms of software, um, some example preconditions are um, you know, the same network trust zone. So what this happens is like, well, if you can SSH into this particular service, uh, you're in the internal trust zone and you can go to any of the other servers. Um, which is something that people always exploit for lateral movement um, in pen tests. Um, and yeah, the same kind of thing. Even in web apps, a valid session token is also kind of like trust. So you don't have to keep on putting your username and password there. As long as you have that valid session token, the web app trusts that it's you and you can go around the web app without re-authenticating. Um, the thing about trust is that it can be one way or mutual. So um, with like mutual TLS, that's a mutual trust. Um, with just regular TLS, that's one way. And so what I want to introduce here is coupling in terms of security, which is a combination of mutual trust and a degree of inter interdependence. So let's talk about the, the cash dollar solutions that you could be deploying. Uh, maybe you work for Amazon or something like that, and you've got your cool in-house secret management um, systems. Uh, but in general, what's out there is that many enterprise container orchestration platforms actually like have their own way of distributing secrets, and most of that actually um, leverages exploiting some trust relationships to get the secret where it needs to be. So, um, yeah, it's mostly secret injection, or maybe mounting like a shared volume. In, in the case of Kubernetes, um, what you would do is you'd encrypt the, the storage and then mount it to the container, and then the container could decrypt it, and that's how it gets its secrets. Um, for some of these other solutions, it's mostly injected in, in environment variables, and maybe if you don't want to do that, then, then um, stay with me. Uh, there's also some open source tools that leverage this paradigm, so it requires ecosystem buy-in. So there's nconsole that works on systems that use console as a service discovery module. So console is a key value store, and um, what happens with nconsole is that the key value store is then coupled with the secret storage, and in the end it injects containers, uh, injects those secrets into the containers at runtime. But what do you do if you don't have control over your scheduler logic, you can't afford an enterprise license or a product, and or don't want to invest in a new orchestration ecosystem? Well, um, yeah, I guess he checks all three boxes. So um, if we want to reason about this from first principles, you might be like, OK, cool, how about I launch the container, and then the container makes some calls to ask vaults for secrets after you launch. Um, so the problem is that once you've launched a container, you shouldn't be trusting it. So um, with trust, you can trust a container as long as you haven't launched it yet. But once you have launched it and it's making calls to your internal network, that could be any old jackass making that call. So you shouldn't be trusting your containers. Um, if, it, if the container authenticates to vault with a secret, how does that secret get there in the first place? So if you're not really doing the, um, the cool trust stuff beforehand, you know, it gets a bit difficult to get that first secret that makes sure that this container is legit. Um, the other question is, how does Vault confirm the identity and permissions of the client container, right? Um, you know, so solving this by trusting all the actors who can connect over a private interface is like possibly a solution, but it is too coarse grain. So um, what I mean by that is you might have different container classes that need different, um, different access to different um, different levels of access to your stateful services. Um, if you just be like, okay, one size fits all, if you can connect over this interface, then you get access to everything. That's how lateral, is, uh, lateral movement happens. So let's not do that. Well, this brings me to this overarching concept in secret distribution, which is called the secure introduction problem. And what that basically means is that if we can securely get the initial secret granting the container access to Vault or your secret management system, then the container can securely fetch all the subsequent secrets. But how do we fetch this first secret? So um, Jeff Mitchell, which is one of the engineers at Vault, um, had a really good talk about one of the patterns that you can use, which is the secure introduction agent. If you're interested, um, here is his YouTube talk, and he has like nice clean pictures over there. Um, and yeah, I really highly recommend the talk. It's called Secure Introduction at Scale. Think like a Vault developer. 
So what does a secure introduction agent do and what does it look like? How does it fit in the stuff? So what it is, is it's closely coupled with the cluster scheduler um, and maintains a mapping of the container properties, for example, um, a launched app name or container name, uh, to vault policies. What this happens is to minimize the attack surface of the initial secret, we use wrap tokens. What is a wrap token, you might ask? Well, um, it's basically a single-use token whose purpose is to encapsulate a token value. So this is one of the very nice things about wrap token is that it can bypass some of the concerns you might have with um, passing things on, as environment variables. It is single-use. Once the true token value is extracted, the wrapping token is useless. So, okay, who cares if an attacker gets it? Like, it's not useful to them. Um, yeah, and it also lowers the risk of exposure through logs or um, logs of the intermediary services that that wrap token might pass through. So, how does this look in practice? So, um, if you are familiar with DCOS um, or MISAS or you've touched that ecosystem before, this might make a bit more sense because I've got the schedule as Marathon there. Um, or it can be MISAS if you don't use Marathon. Um, you've got the stateful services. As an example, I've put Postgres here. Vault is our old friend here, and then the new actor here is the secure, uh, secure introduction agent. And um, at the moment, we're using Gatekeeper, but um, I'm sure there are other agents out there that can do that. So um, if you go and say to the scheduler, hey, please run this Docker image. Um, by the way, it needs access to this Postgres. Uh, your scheduler is like, cool. And they launch the container. So once that container is launched, it's like, hey, everybody, um, I'm the container. I'm new now. I need a Vault token to get my Postgres credentials. And what that does is it, it asks the secure introduction agent for that. The secure introduction agent, by the way, like is very closely coupled with the scheduler. So um, yeah. And the secure introduction asks the scheduler, hey, scheduler, is Purple Rain a legit container? Um, and that's how identity, uh, identity gets verified. So as you might probably start thinking now, you really need to like look at your secure introduction agent and make sure it is actually coupled there and um, secured. So once it gets confirmation that Purple Rain is a legit container, then, um, then it looks to its own internal mappings of the Purple Rain container and their vault policies. So what this does is it says, OK, well, the container that is prefixed with Purple Rain can log into vault and read these defaults and Postgres credentials. Then it goes to Vault and it says, hi, Vault, it's me, the secure introduction agent. Please make my friend a token with the default and Postgres policies. Here's my auth token, by the way, which um, I got at some point. And if all goes well, Vault will pass back a wrapped token to the SI agent and says, here, give it to your friend who can redeem it for the real token value. It's important to note that at this point, the secure introduction agent does not unwrap the value. Um, and that's, that's for good reason, because if it has any logs or if somebody intercepts that value, and you know, can't get access to Vault, that means that it's not useful for them. Cool, then the SI agent passes it to the container and says, here you go, Purple Rain, have your token. And what the container can do is make some calls to Vault and be like, please unwrap this token, give me the real value. Because at the moment, you can't really do anything with that value on Vault other than unwrap. Once that's unwrapped, the real token value goes back to the Purple Rain container happy days, it can now make calls to Vault and ask it for credentials, which it does in this next step. Hi, Vault. Please give me secrets for Postgres. Here's my token, by the way. That's the wrapped value. All goes well, and Vault says, here you go. Postgres, the username's admin. Password's admin. And then it can use those credentials to make calls to the stateful service. Okay, so, I mean, that's pretty cool, but um, you might notice that it's admin, admin, again, like, surely we can do better than this for all clients and connecting to that resource. But Mary, that's how lateral movement happens. So let's try and kill this bird and a different bird with one stone next. So once we've distributed our secrets, um, it's time to manage the secret life cycle. So as I mentioned, this is to narrow the temporal attack surface, but it also has some other surprising advantages. What you need to do um, is you need to revoke secrets from entities no longer acquiring them. You need to revoke compromised secrets and issue some new ones, which is a key rolling. Uh, destroy invalid secrets and prevent reuse of the secret value. And you can actually do all of this in one, in a couple of fell swoops. Um, 
And here are the benefits that you get. So you reduce the valid validity period of secrets to narrow its temporal attack surface. You can reduce the algorithmic attack surface by not exposing expired credentials with the same generation method. You can reduce the usefulness of compromised credentials to the malicious parties. And then let's think about automating this at scale, because scaling is really interesting. Um, so how do we actually do this? I'm going to introduce some primitives and some glue that puts everything together. Cool. So the first secret management primitive is dynamic secrets. So what are dynamic secrets? They're lazily generated when they're needed from one master secret. So um, I'll explain how that works in the next section, but the advantage is, is that it prevents hard coding of secrets. It prevents secret reuse by automating new secret generation. It supports automated renewal and rotation of secrets. And the nice thing about this is that it does actually scale well for unique passwords in one to infinity resource client scenario. So if you have like N clients that are trying to connect to a single resource, all of them can have a unique password that can be rolled, um, that can be audited, um, and you don't have to reuse the same credentials. Cool, so um, an example of this is maybe trying to connect to Postgres. So the secret management services holds a master secret, which is maybe a username and password, to a Postgres database. So this master secret is authorized to create new roles. It has the like create role privilege on Postgres. When a consumer needs access to that database, it requests a new set of dynamic secrets from Vault. Vault then authenticates to the Postgres database with the master secrets, then runs some queries to create the dynamic secrets. So it runs actually like create role queries. Um, and then Postgres spits out some new credentials. And the important part is, um, if you're familiar with Postgres, there's a password expiry. And um, so it spits out new credentials with an expiry period on, on the credentials. And then Vault wraps the new secret with some metadata and returns it to the consumer. What is this metadata, you might ask? It's the second primitive, which is leases. So leases are metadata for issued secrets that describe the validity. So each dynamic secret and auth token issued um, has a lease ID, and it also has some info on, you know, like how, how long does the secret have to live, um, which is the time to live value. Um, is it renewable? Can I renew the secret and extend its time to live by renewing it? Leases allow the validity period of secrets to be extended for secrets to be revoked. Um, and then leases with a short TTL forces consumers to check in with Vault continuously to keep the secrets from expiring. So that is a really great advantage because it can automate secret cleanup. If your consumer is dead, it no longer uh, renews those credentials and the credentials expire. Uh, you don't have to do that manually at all. So how do we put all of this together? So in a very general sense, the container launches, um, it goes through the dance, it gets its credentials, and maybe in your container you have a helper process um, that fetches the required secrets to a file or to the environment. File may be a bit better, but honestly, like if you've compromised the process of the uh, application that's exposed to the internet, like you know, you can read it. Um, the helper process also makes calls to Vault to renew the leases on the secrets. So while the consumer is still alive, the helper process keeps picking Vault and be like, "Yeah, please renew this. Please renew this." Like a library book that never gets returned. Um, <laughs> and so as long as the container is alive, presumably the secrets remain valid, which is really great. But if the container dies, help a process stops renewing leases and lets those secrets expire. And you don't have to do anything. So in conclusion, um, secret management in medium scale open source systems is still relatively unexplored. There are a lot of solutions out there already, um, but in terms of a really mature solutions, that's, um, it's more of the enterprise space or like you know, an in-house solution for things. If you wanna do things open source, it's a really great playground um, to have a look and think about these workflows. In a pinch, you can use your scheduler as an identity server for clients that consume secrets. Um, uh, moving beyond storing secrets in cloud repositories is possible without you know, paying fiat currency. You still have to spend some time to like, make it work, but you don't have to pay for you know, a license or anything because you can all do this with open source tools. Um, and the last thing is pretty interesting, um, which is that most secret management solutions for ca container orchestration platforms they exploit trust and couplings to distribute secrets. So you're not, I don't think you're gonna see um, containers authenticating back um, to your cluster organization, sorry, your container orchestration apps and proving its own identity. What it does is it usually, um, it usually exploits a trust relationship that happens before the container is launched. So um, see if you can spot where it happens. 
And um, if you're keen, here's some open source tools. So HashCorp Vault is there. You can check that out. Um, for a secure introduction agent, um, it's reasonably, reasonably OK. Um, it's called Vault Gatekeeper Mesos. Um, you can pull that and have a look at it. It has a Docker image, so you can run that fairly, fairly easily. Um, there's also Vault Keeper. So when I mentioned um, the agent that's inside the container that fetches and renews secrets, um, there is a tool that we built called Vault Keeper, which, which is that kind of tool for Docker containers. And it's especially good because it solves some problems that might be presented um, on Python and Unicorn applications. Um, and then very lastly, there's Env Console. That's very cool. Um, that's also one of the things that um, is coupled with the scheduler, but it injects secrets as environment variables. Um, before they launch. Thank you very much. Um, if you're keen, feel free to drop me a mail at my email address. Um, any cool questions? Um, thanks very much. Questions? <laughs> cool. Anybody has any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, no, I think I, I, that's a very good point because um, if you want to be automating things at scale, um, you want to be able to store these things in Vault. So the one solution that we, we want to be using is puppeting Vault, which you know it leads you back to the same problem. So at the moment, I haven't um, haven't really seen any good solutions for that, but that is it's definitely the next step to make this useful for people. Any other questions? Huh? Oh, no, I wish, I wish. Yes. Yes, actually, Vault can use, so instead of an initial um, auth token, Vault does have integrations for LDAP and OAuth as well. So you can use those solutions as well. At the moment, like, we, I mean, we're too lazy to have our own LDAP server, which is why we use tokens. But yeah, you can. So feel free to go around. Yeah. Mm. Yes, you can use it for others. So um, when I made an example with Postgres, Vault supports a lot of different backends that actually can use that can make dynamic secrets from that. Vault even acts as like a, it can actually be a certificate server if you really want it. So it's got a lot of support for uh, for key generation um, and dynamic stuff in that regard. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so at the moment, we we try to we're serving HTTPS from the cluster, and there's it's a bit of a pain trying to distribute this um, the certificates onto all our load balancers actually. So using Vault as a central place to store and distribute certificates is the next step, and that's in the fantasy league. We really like to do that. Yes. Mm. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. So at the, vault, uh, at the moment, Vault has a lot of different modules that you can manage secrets with. And you're right, if you want to manage arbitrary secrets, you will have to, um, it needs a new um, secret backend in Vault. Um, the process at the moment is that they don't accept submissions for that, so that's maybe a bit of a weakness. They have a general generic storage backend, but if you're wanting to do dynamic support stuff, you want native support for it. Um, at the moment, they're not accepting requests because they don't trust people who, you know, roll their own secret stuff. Yes and no. Um, so for databases, there is a plugin system, and you can write your own plugin, and that's that's legit. Um, for not database things, um, it's it's a bit trickier. But it's, it's got some pretty full featured, um, you know, the list of, of backend offerings is, is pretty good. So maybe have a look still. Yes, there was a question back there. Yes. Yes. 
Yeah, HSM, I'm not so sure about, but it does have um, does have support for encrypting like data streams um, and generating keys for that. Um, but maybe have a look at it because it's always it is always adding backends. Yes. Hmm. Excellent. Yeah, there's as always there's an enterprise version and it's it's like. Yeah, maybe a bit out of scope for the budget talk, but I'm very glad to hear that. Um, any more questions? All right, thank you very much.